you are listening to Squid and the Ultimate Leaf Spin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Squid and the Ultimate Leaf Spin, brought to you by the Hockey News. With over 2 million dedicated readers, the Hockey News, established in 1947, is the authoritative source of hockey and the number one hockey publication in North America. With an ever-growing podcast network and video database on top of an already established print and digital brand, the Hockey News is there to cover all major hockey stories around the world. Visit THN.com slash deal to get the best value on subscription to the Hockey News. I'm Mike Wilson, the Ultimate Leafs fan, and with me as always, my winger, Ricky Squid Five. How are we doing today, Squid? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Got a round of golf in already, and... uh... It was a little chilly, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I I went out for my usual walk here this just before we we started recording, and it's uh, the long pants are starting to come out, baby. The sweatpants. So it's pants, little... uh, the under uh, uh, thing underneath uh, the golf shirt, and then another top on top of that. But yeah. Anyway. Well, we've got an interesting show today. We've got a terrific guest. I, I think the the listeners and viewers are going to love Brad May. Uh, terrific guest, great stories. Uh, real, real nice opinions, and just uh, just an all around great guy. Oh, fantastic guy! And uh, I know I played with him in Buffalo, and uh, when he broke in, uh, he was just a kid. Uh, I was nearing the end of my career, so I was probably about thirty at the time. And uh, but he was a great, enthusiastic young guy coming into the fold, and uh, he fit in really, really nice. Well, guys, are gonna uh, you're in for a treat today, guys. You're gonna like you're gonna like when uh, we bring Brad on in a couple of minutes. But we do have to touch on uh, congratulating Tampa on winning the Stanley Cup. We finally have a champion. Uh, kudos to the NHL for a terrific playoff run. Uh, I would have to say, however, though, at a cost of seventy-five to hundred million dollars, the numbers are coming out now. I would suggest uh, that that business model is not going to keep you in business too long. So. There's going to have to be some readjustments moving forward if the NHL is going to carry on for the next season. Absolutely. There's going to have to be something that's going to have to be done. But uh, it, was, it was great to watch. The hockey was excellent. Uh, right at the beginning, it was a little bit maybe sloppy. But, you know, I mean, they've had four months off. But yeah. what, the, great, the, the best one I saw was uh, John Cooper – at the podium after it was all over. He wouldn't go up there without all his staff, for starters. Yes. And then he said, we're going home 35 pounds heavier. And then he laughed. And his laugh was hilarious. And uh, I thought that was fantastic. And uh, the way that they got together before the Stanley Cup was awarded, uh, I'm sure Stamkos had something to do with that. But uh, I, I thought it was done extremely well. Yeah, it was very, very classy. So, again, congratulations to them. And it's going to be our turn one of these days. So we'll keep the faith. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it doesn't stop there because a couple of days from now, the draft is next on the agenda. I should re- yeah. put the shame of self-promotional uh, plug in there because the same day of the draft, my book is released that day, October the 6th. So be aware of that. Okay, guys. Uh, but looking forward to talking to you guys about that one in the next few weeks. And then we got squids coming up in the next month. But the draft is on Wednesday, or is on Tuesday night, pardon me, starting at 7 o'clock. There is a couple of guys that are looming around free agency, so we may get a surprise or two come Monday and maybe really Tuesday before the draft. Or what do you think? Well, I, you know, I think there's going to be – looking at it now uh, and, and reading a lot about what's going on, I mean, this could be one of the biggest goalie carousels that, that we may have yeah. ever seen. I mean, they're getting bought out. Jimmy Howard apparently is going to get bought out by Detroit. Um, I, you know what? I just, I have a feeling that you might see five or six goaltenders in different places next year. Yes. And it's all shaping up that way. Tory Krug has, it looks like the talk is he's going to be moved for the right to speak to him or exclusive negotiation. Uh, so there's some moves taking place that uh, it could be pretty interesting in the next couple of days. But again, we will watch with definite interest. And next time we speak to you guys, there obviously to be some further changes. But I guess without further ado, I want to turn it over to the man we're here speaking about this hour, and that's Brad May. Squid, our guest today, had a long, successful career in the NHL playing for seven teams, played in Vancouver twice, won a cup in Anaheim, 
is more known, I think it's safe to say, for his seven years in Buffalo, scoring an overtime goal with maybe the most iconic call in league history. I'm referring to none other than, of course, Brad May, or should I say May Day. Brad, thanks for joining us today. How is things going? Doing, doing so good right now. It's, um, it's been a, obviously an odd time this year, but um, we've had a great summer north of Toronto, and um, I just went out fishing this morning, so September's been good. That's great. I mean, now, I, I mean, obviously you've been spending some time up north, it sounds like, but have you got anything on the go or post-pandemic, if we can ever see anything going forward? Yeah, you know what? Lots of ideas. Um, certainly a lot of, a lot of planning, you know, to, to be done here, but none of us know when this thing's going to slow down or end, and, and um, so you can't really look too forward. But um, my wife and I are doing great. Kids are awesome. We're all healthy, which um, obviously we're, we're thankful for, but everybody watching and listening, I hope everybody's doing good too. Well, I think, um, uh, I think now that the cup run is over, you must have had a little smile on your face as those guys were skating around the ice celebrating with the, the cup victory in Tampa last night. What did you, th- just give us your thoughts on Tampa winning first off and maybe secondly, your thoughts on the whole bubble experience and the level of play. Well, the, the, you know, I got a few, few thoughts. Number one, um, Luke Shen, who, was my roommate, right? I actually moved in with Luke my last second last year in the NHL when I was traded to Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, I lived with Luke for about a month and a half or two months at his apartment. And um, so I got to watch him hoist the Stanley Cup, which was outstanding. His brother won one last year with St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shen family are ob- obviously, you know, so fortunate and I'm so proud of their, their two sons. But I was really happy to see Luke get that opportunity. Not to mention Steven Stamkos, who's from my hometown in Markham, um, and a number of other players. Tampa was definitely one of the best teams. They have been for many years, and um, it wasn't a shock for Tampa to actually go out and win the Stanley Cup. Um, they they fell short or have fallen short, you know, over the last number of years for what all the expectations were for them. So um, I think the right team did win. Mm-hmm. What I was watching last night, though, and I. I got excited. I got emotional actually watching these guys celebrate, but I also felt terrible for, for the guys in Dallas. Corey Perry, who I was so lucky to play with and, and, um, and win a Stanley Cup 13 years ago with Corey. Um, you know, he was a young guy when he came, obviously, in the league. And, you know, probably with the teams he's played on, he's probably, you know, thinking that he should have three or four Stanley Cups because, you know, good teams and opportunities and um, – it's amazing 13 years later or 14 I think for his career he's only got one and um, to lose obviously to go that far for what they all had to sacrifice it's you know it's amazing, amazing amazing that's one more than I have <laughs> <laughs> but you know what if I be, isn't it like you you always remember the team that wins yeah um, yeah they the win but you know every other team like they won they had to win 12 games for sure to get there in the playoffs, win three rounds. And for these guys, they sacrificed for 60, 70 days in the bubble. And a lot of us thought before the playoffs even started or this resumed the play that, you know, there's going to be an asterisk beside, beside the Stanley Cup. I, been, that couldn't be further from the truth. In many ways, I know they were in, you know, one location, so they weren't traveling on the road and stuff. But to be away from home in a hotel, for 60 days, back-to-back games in some cases, which you used to play in 5 you know, in the 80s. They used to play back-to-backers. Yeah. It hasn't been for a long time. And um, the, everything that these guys have gone through, they didn't get to see their, their families, their kids. I mean, some babies were born and, 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 and dad couldn't go and see them. And it's, uh, it's remarkable that uh, the NHL did such a good job, kept everybody safe and healthy. Toronto was outstanding. Of course, Edmonton, where it was, you know, finalized um, both cities, uh, both bubbles were amazing. Well, let me ask you a question about the bubbles. I mean, I, I heard a comment, I, I can't remember who it was, but uh, it was one of the coaches and said that had played back in my, my day or before me and said that, yeah, they, they all have these, uh, they're playing video games and they're playing table tennis and everything. He said, if it was back in my day, there'd be a brawl. <laughs> Could you imagine if there was, Eight teams staying or four teams staying in the same hotel back when you were started playing, what it would have been like? Well, I think it's it's so different, right? It really is. Obviously, a lot more drinking, I'm sure, would have would have taken place back in the day. Um, you know what? I, it's it's so hard to 
to compare eras. Obviously, um, these young guys, it, they're your grandchildren, Rick, and they're my children. You know, that that's yeah. the ages, right? <laughs> Seriously, I'm not knocking, but isn't that the truth that um, the world's so different? But, yeah. um, but the, yes, the video games, all the, all the, the, the media, social media, the ability to connect with people that you, you weren't with on FaceTime and all of that, um, Zoom chats that we're on right now, probably saved these guys. There's no doubt about it. But yeah. 65 days, 35 years ago, um, would have been very, very different. Yeah. Let's refresh your memory here, Brad. We'll get into life as a minor hockey league player. Born in Toronto, raised in Markham. Uh, ended up in Niagara Falls playing junior hockey. Maybe walk us through that period. You know what, I, I started, I was, well, I was 13 years old, I played house league hockey. That means that you're on the bottom of the barrel. Um, I played every, every Saturday morning between 6, 7, or 8 in the morning. I had been cut from the double-A team, and I, again, 13 years old. Five years later, I was a first-round pick and my first line mate in my NHL career and my debut. Um, to play professional hockey was with Rick Vive, who obviously Squid was an unbelievable um, captain for the Maple Leafs, but we played in Buffalo together, and um, I got—I was very lucky, very fortunate to to be able to play with such great, um, great people, great mentors, um, from Rick to Colin Patterson to Pat Lafontaine, and of course the late Dale Howarchuk, um, to name a few. Dave Anderchuk being another um, well-known Leaf. To have a good veteran class of players, yeah. veteran that actually can impart their experiences and knowledge, you know, on you as a young guy made a huge difference um, for me. I, I had good mentors. Well, let's go back to junior playing in Niagara Falls, like coming from our community, going to play major hockey through that period. I think Squid mentioned to me, you actually played with Brian Fogarty back in that uh, era, I believe. I, I did. Yeah. I was, I was with folks, which would have been his last year, but um, he actually broke Bobby Orr's records. Um, is it 1988 or 89? Um, um, broke Bobby Orr's records playing for the Niagara Falls Thunder. Um, I had never seen a player like this. Um, I think Brian's life ended way too short. Um, his professional career wasn't as good as you know as his talent mm -hmm. um, should have taken him. Um, obviously, that's lifestyle choices and and the way he lived. But Brian Fogarty was an amazing guy, and um, yeah, just watching him skate. He's, he's the one guy that, that probably, um, in my estimation, I mean, he could have been, or he certainly had the talent to be a Hall of Fame player, for sure. That's just, that's just so sad to see that. Did you use that as a motivation for yourself as you saw this? I don't like to use the word train wreck, but this young kid ruining his life. Or see, you, you could see the end. Obviously, it wasn't going to be good. Yeah, you know what? Like we, it's, we all understood that Brian was maybe he had – he could go to another level, um, having fun that, that, by the way, is not having fun now. It's, you know, doing harm to yourself, but uh, he, he actually could do it and he could perform. And, and I, 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 I want to say Bill LaForge was our coach at the time, but um, if Brian Fogarty didn't get paid to play hockey and he, he was a kid the whole way through. And if, if you didn't introduce professionalism and, and, and money, to the to that um, recipe for Brian Fogarty, he would have been a Hall of Famer. I think the pressure, obviously, the money took him to different places that he didn't, you know, he wouldn't have had a chance to 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 get to. So, um, if he could just play the kids' game of hockey forever, I mean, we 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 met, we all missed out on watching a great player. Let me ask you about your first game. And uh, you well, can... before you do it, before we do that, let's go to the draft. The draft, I think, is really important, Squid. So oh, let's yeah. get let's get to that first. Uh, 1990 draft. They talk about this being one of the greatest drafts of all time. Now you, uh, other than 1979. Uh, okay, but you stop saying that. You, you've played every week on this show. Okay, enough, enough, enough. We know 79 year draft in fifth overall. Okay, now uh, 1990 draft. A couple of things here, and I just want to get the listeners to understand what you're walking through now. Here's Brad coming into the, the to the draft. You go show up on draft day, I assume, and think of, walk us through this part of the day. Now, here is one of the biggest trades taking place with Dale Howardchuk going from Winnipeg, franchise player moving to Buffalo, Phil Housley going the other way, a trade of draft picks so Buffalo could move up to 14th, and the pick, I think, was at 19th, ended up being Keith Chuck, and then you going at 14th. What 
was the process of that whole day for you? And just like, was this just your head just spinning? Well, you know what? Leading up to the draft, it was in Vancouver, um, which I ended up playing, you know, twice in school. That's, that's, that's it. Um, what a wonderful place Vancouver is. But, um, yeah, I, I had a bunch of meetings with different teams and had to do physical testing with a number of them as well prior to the draft. And I kind of – I didn't know where I was going to go. I really um, – in many ways, I was green. I, I didn't expect it anything I of course leading up to the you know draft day I you know I kept moving up and, and certainly the ratings and yeah I, I had no idea but it, the one team I didn't um, spend time with I went to Winnipeg for three days and, and went to the University of Manitoba and tested and did all the stuff with the Winnipeg Jets but I never went or even talked to the Buffalo Sabres however I played junior hockey 25 minutes from there 30 minutes from from Buffalo so they were able to get to see me you know, for, for two years prior to my draft and, and had their idea. But when, when they made that, the, the trade, um, I looked at my, my family, my girlfriend was with me, my wife of 26 years now, but she was sitting be, behind me actually. And I remember, remember saying to her, I'm like, I wonder if, cause I always thought like I grew up in Toronto, Buffalo's way too close. It's all 25 minutes down the road from Penn yeah. junior. It's almost too good to be true. And, and then when Jerry Mean walked up to the podium and um, I want to say he said the Buffalo Sabres select a semi-local boy, I think is what he said. And um, as soon as he did that, it was, um, it, it, was, it was one of the – well, at that time, the greatest feeling um, I ever had playing hockey. I mean, that somebody recognized you and in the trade. And I didn't know who the, who the Winnipeg Jets were going to pick at 19. But after they selected Keith Kachuk, who was a high school player and played 8 or 12 that year – Literally, he hadn't played a lot of hockey. And um, a few years into our careers, Keith Kachuk signs for seven or eight million bucks or whatever it ends up being um, with the Winnipeg Jets or Phoenix Coyotes. And um, I just saved Winnipeg and Phoenix franchises a lot of money that, that the Buffalo Sabres selected me. So that's the way I, I say that because Kachuk is one of the best power forwards in, in, in certainly the, the, the 90s and, and into the 2000s. Now, now, take us through this part. Here's it. Now, you got traded with – and now, Howard Chuck, you had a close relationship with him, and unfortunately, the hockey world has lost him recently. Um, during that period, when you arrived at camp, take us through camp, but also did you and – did Howard Chuck come up to you and make a joke to you? I mean, you're a first pick. He was the first overall pick. You're part of the trade coming to a new team. The expectations on the both of you would be high, maybe a little tougher on you because you're going in with a role to play. How did that all unfold? I, you know what? I don't remember all that. I, I do remember seeing Dale. I remember going to the um, – it was a Craig Rearn golf course where we had a mm -hmm. golf day. and yeah. the, um, the, the start of training camp, teams would do that. And, and you had 75 players and four different teams that would show up at your practice facility and, you know, scrimmage and play. And like, like Squid was talk, talking about back in late, late 80s, this was in early 90s, but – where fighting was a major part where you'd have seven or eight tough guys that would go to training camp to beat the crap out of one another to become teammates, essentially. Um, and then you had players like, like Rick and, and, and the veteran players are like, listen, they wanted to stay out of that fray and they just wanted to get through training camp, get in shape and, 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 and be in good condition going into the season. So I don't know. I was, I definitely had interactions with Dale, but I mean, our relationship wasn't, you know, as strong as it became. Um, obviously, just living and spending all that time together and, and, and being mentored by, by some good, good veterans. Um, I was very lucky. Now, how would your first scrimmage go? Like, you, when did it sort of reality and expectation hit you that I better deliver what these guys are looking for? I mean, did you go looking for it or these, were you challenged immediately? Because, let's face it, every guy in camp would know who you are because you're a first pick. Well, there's no question. So I, I would say two things. My last year junior, I scored a lot of goals. Um, mm -hmm. Like every like every player that elevates from yep. junior or college to the National Hockey League, we're all probably the best player on our team or, yep. or certainly in that class. Um, so I knew I could do that. But then again, can you do it at the next level with, with pros and men? Um, the one thing I – the other element I had is I love fighting. I <laughs> – I, it's probably the only thing I miss about playing hockey today that I don't get to go out and tee off on somebody. Um, getting punched in the face, 
which I didn't get punched in the face often. I, I mean, I, I learned how to fight pretty well, but, um, but when you got hit and you knew you could take the other guy's best punch, um, to me, that's, it's one of the things I miss, um, uh, that adrenaline, um, part, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm an excitable guy. So I knew that when I went into training camp, um, I'm actually, I had hurt my, so I'm 19 years old when I go in, Rob Ray's one of the toughest, he's a young guy too, but he's right. probably him and Mike Hartman. And there's a few other guys that were at training camp. And I was like, listen, I, if I'm going to make this team, I'm going to fight each and every one of them, you know, yeah. and it just so happened that my first game was against Rob's team. And, um, Funny, I'm, I'm in Saberland, which is maybe one of the worst hockey arenas, you know, twin, <laughs> twin plexes ever built in, in, in certainly the National Hockey League circle. But, um, and I get in a, a fist fight with Rob Ray in the second period or something, and it was a good one. And all of a sudden, everybody, they take notice, right? And um, I did well. I mean, Rob was, you know, I, I, I got, I cut him actually, um, which doesn't mean that you win or lose, but for everybody else's, the optics of it was, oh my God, this kid just cut Rob Ray in a fight and, and it helped me. And I think in many ways that probably gave me a much better opportunity to make the team because they were like, okay, we don't have to worry about this guy. He's going to stand up for not only himself. Now, what can he do for his teammates? And um, again, having good veteran players that would say, hey, they talk you off, off the shelf sometimes and say, look, now's not the time. And and other times I'd have, I'd have teammates say, Hey, listen, so-and-so is in my grill. Um, take care of it. And as soon as I was told that again, when you love something, you know, you go after it. And, uh, it was fun. I had a good time. I really did. So now Rick, we want to get to the first game. So Rob, or Rob, Rob, right? That's not Rob Ray. But, uh, Brad, we want you to, no, I was going to talk about the fight, but I thought what we do is let's get to your first game. The first game walked us through that whole day. For me, it was, well, I, I actually, it's, it's, and I'm not making this up. This is, this would be part of my story if it wasn't talking to you and if, if yeah. it wasn't on, on here as well. Um, for me, I, I, I'm playing with Christian Rutu and Rick Vive. I think probably um, Rick Dudley, our coach, told me that I was, you know, playing. I practiced on that line the day before, or whatever it was. This is after training camp. And um, I just remember my girlfriend was driving down from Markham and she came down to Buffalo. And Joyce Vive took her aside and because Bridget was waiting outside um, our locker room, I think, um, after the game. And, um, and Joyce took her aside and said, no, no, you're, you're one of us. You're a girlfriend. You're one of us. You come into the wives' room, which, you know, when you get to that level, I mean, it's, it's awfully intimidating. It's intimidating for a hockey player, let alone, um, you know, your, your, your companion. And, uh, and Joyce couldn't have been nicer took took bridge under under her wing and literally gave us all an experience um and i say all oh, my my group my family that you know what we're going to be taken care of here and um uh, but when i lined up on the ice and i we were playing against mario lemieux mark recky and kevin stevens stanley cup winners and of course you know that line they're maybe one of the best lines oh, yeah. in, um squid christian rutu and i were tasked to play against mario's line that whole night my first game and I think we came out of it. We lost the game, Squid, but um, you and I had a couple points each, so that was fun. And we shut them down. We did. Yeah. <laughs> but but Mario had five points on the power play, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, he might have, I think. But, you know, it was a lot of fun. And uh, Buffalo, uh, you know, thinking, speaking of Buffalo, uh, and, and you talk about Saberland, yeah, it wasn't the greatest, but back then – that was standard for practice rinks in the, in the National Hockey League. And, uh, but what a great city, uh, great place to live, bring up your kids. I got to bring both my boys up uh, there and, and the school system was fantastic. Uh, I, I, I love the place. I, I really did. Yeah, no, hey, listen, anybody, I know Toronto, Toronto probably bags on Buffalo a little bit. So, you know, maybe if you're not from the Niagara Peninsula area, but um, Buffalo is awesome. Like it, it, it was 20 minutes to get everywhere. You didn't have the traffic like you do in bigger cities. Um, it was a small town feel. You didn't have like the big restaurant chains and, and um, all the commercialized, you know, which obviously is there now, but it was all mom and pop restaurants. And yeah. when you walked in, it was, you know, they knew your name, you knew the name of the, the, the owner or the manager. And 
as a Buffalo Saber player, you got treated so well in Buffalo. And the real estate was a lot less than Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing, I, I do remember though, um, Squid had a, like back at, I, I don't even know what, like outside of a Ford Mercury or pickup, I don't know, make up the name of whatever vehicle. I remember going into the training camp or, you know, our, our, our car parking lot and Vivi had one of the nicest Mercedes 1991 squid. It was good to be I had to wait till I got to Chicago to buy that because I couldn't afford it in Canada and in Toronto. I was getting taxed too much and the price was a lot higher. So I got to Chicago and taxes were better. And it, it, that was a good story because I was probably 28 or 29 or something like that and uh, walked into the dealership. Well, first of all, I got my check and it was about 5,000 every two weeks more than what I was making in Toronto. And uh, so I walked into the dealership and none of the, the salesperson came over to me. So I walked out, went to another dealership, same thing happened. So I go back to the first one a week later, I walk in, I got jeans on, t-shirt, I'm, you know, and this, guy probably only a couple of years older than me, he comes up to me, he says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I want to buy that black Mercedes right there. He goes, well, you want to lease it? I said, no, no, I want to buy it. And he says, well, it's, it's $62,000. And I said, yeah, but it won't be when we're done. And we sat down, <laughs> hammered it out, paid 58, <laughs> wrote, wrote out a check, and away I went. So, and I I still had that, that, I think that's a car that I kept the longest of any car I ever had. <laughs> See, that, that's, I was going to say, that's the pro man's version of the Derek Sanderson story, and he bought the Rolls Royce. <laughs> you guys remember that one when he went in, and he, the guy wouldn't serve him, and, he, and so he bought the car, and he said, don't give that a guy the commission, and he drove it off the lot. <laughs> hey, Derek Sanderson's a beauty, absolute beauty. He certainly is. We've had, we've spoke to him a few times. He's been to a few of our charity events that we've had. So he's, he's a terrific, terrific guy. Brad, getting back to your first time through the league, did you sense that, uh, you now you, you've already answered the question, you enjoyed fighting. So were you looking for it every game that they were going to come at you? Not were you starting it, but were you aware that these guys were going to be challenging to right off the bat because of who you were or you were becoming? And also maybe some of your surprises going through the NHL when you got there, like things like, was it way better than you thought? Were these guys way better than you thought? Or was it maybe you can, you can play at this level? Um, I think, okay, so talking about the fighting first. Yes. Um, um, just coming in, there, so you have a few fights, training camp, obviously, and then you go in exhibition games. And I, I remember I was, it was in Montreal. Um, I think we were losing 7-2 or whatever. We were losing big anyways. And late in the game, I ended up, we went out, it was a three-on-three -three situation. Obviously, guys were all in the penalty box. And three-on-three, yeah. and, three, and our coach sent myself, um, Gord Donnelly, and um, Brad Miller. And Brad Miller was a six-foot-five defenseman, tough guy. Mm -hmm. And the Montreal Canadiens had Shane Corson, Mario Roberge, and Todd Ewan. And um, anyways, so I don't get to choose, right? I'm the 19-year-old kid, so... so <laughs> Gord Donnelly's being the Quebec Nordique player and, you know, playing against Montreal, he, he already had his guy. So I, I, I want to say he fought Ewan, if I'm not mistaken, whatever. And then Brad Miller, he's the older guy coming out of the Rochester, a couple years older than I am. He, he, he chooses Roberge or whoever he fights. So now by default, I, 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 I guess I'm going to fight Shane Corson. Well, Shane, Shane played in the same junior um, organization I did for the same coach, Bill LaForge. So for the last three years, when I was playing junior hockey, I used to use course and sticks, right? We only had one, one pattern in our locker, left-handed curve, and it was a course and pattern, Louisville. And um, anyway, so I have all these thoughts in my head. Now it's a face-off outside the blue line. Everybody in the building except for Brad knows that the moment the puck drops, there's going to be three fights. <laughs> The only reason why I say that, I knew I was going to fight, but I, was, I had to be center. I had to play center, you know, to start that shift, which is so stupid. So I learned a valuable lesson early on. When you're in that situation, it doesn't matter if nobody cares if you win the faceoff or lose the faceoff. I, I have my bottom hand turned over like I'm going to snap it back to my defenseman who's already in a fight, right? Like it was 
completely idiotic. But that's that's what happens when you're young. I end up I, I had I get in a great fight with Shane. We go up and down the ice. They break up the other fights first. And when I fought Course, um, I think that spread right. Like the the holy you know, this young kid comes in the league. He fights Shane because in my estimation, for me anyways, um, I had a lot of tough guys I fought. And Shane Corson, that fight in particular is one of the hardest ones and most intimidating ones, but one of the ones that I did really well at as well. So I got on a little bit of a roll. Um, but it's easy to get on a roll when I had two big brothers. I had Rob Ray and I had Gould Connolly. And um, not, to, to, not to mention other guys. Yeah. Um, when I didn't have to go into certain cities and face the guy who was on the roll, um, the toughest on the ice, you know, on that, on the other team where I kind of fall in where sometimes I get number three and, or number two or whatever. But if I'm going to fight number three on every team, I'm not going to lose. And it, or certainly not very often. And, um, and that's kind of how I got sheltered and brought into the league. So maybe I wouldn't love fighting as much if I got the <laughs> Buffalo. I was the only one and I yeah. took beat. Tonight, right. Um, I, th- I think that was a big thing is I had, I had great teammates that t- alleviated a lot of that pressure. As for playing, mm-hmm. um, you know what? I think you're always afraid to think that, like, am I worthy? Am I, am I good enough to be here? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what practice is about. I, I, I'm sure I'm one of those guys. I didn't really enjoy practice because you'd just rather go and put scrimmage and play. Yeah. But all the details that, you know, you, you, all that work ethic and all the, the, the attention to those details – pay off when you actually get into a game and you follow the, the, the pregame scouting and all these other things that, that, that happen. If you're not aware and if you're not really a student of the game, then chances are you're going to be overwhelmed in the moment. But when you, when you do all your preparation prior to, um, when you show up and write the test, you should be good. You should be fine. And I think, I think I had that because I had good teammates to help me get there. No doubt about it. Um, was I fat? Oh my God, I can skate with these guys. I couldn't hit the net as well as some of them. And Vibe and I worked on that too. Turn the bottom hand over Brad, far post, over the pad, one foot off the ice, short side high. Like I didn't have really a, a game plan to score or shoot. And, and that's what you learn from these, these great pros. And watching the Stanley Cup last night, I said to my wife when we were watching, I'm like, it's unbelievable how fast they are, but it's unbelievable how precise. And all these passes, cross ice, you know, D to D, up the wall, in the middle, these passes are crisp. They're tape to tape. Very often or very seldom did you see guys pulling pucks out of their feet. My line mates had to figure out how to pull pucks out of their feet. I, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, thought, I, was, I, thought, I thought they did that to guys on purpose when they didn't want them to get points. <laughs> Some guys do. Hey, Squid, now chip in here. You, you got some comments in this, too, so chip in here and give us some. By the way, you talk about preparation. And when you came in, uh, I had – we had probably – I would say the most prepared coach, I think, that I ever – that I had in my entire career, Rick Dudley. I mean, he had stacks of paper that thick of notes about the other team and, and each individual player and – and our system, and I, I thought he was a fantastic coach, Rick was, because he had us so prepared that we knew exactly what the other team was going to do uh, the whole night. The only, the only problem with, with, with Duds is he just couldn't trust all of us to do the right thing. <laughs> right? I mean, well, that, that's true. No, but uh, Duds was, Duds was, he might have been the most intimidating, toughest. And, and most rambunctious guy that I started with, right? Our coach? Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah, I had a few of those guys earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Profi, Maloney. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you had a few of them. Yeah, and then, but Duns was so excitable. He would commit. I mean, we, we'd be up to nothing, but if we didn't, if he didn't like the way we played in that period, he'd come in and flip out and, and go crazy and start firing – uh, Gatorade jugs around and stuff like that. So, uh, but but he was well prepared. That, that's what I loved about Duds was when we went out to play, we knew exactly what we were up against, and because he spelled it all out 
like before the game? Well, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, let, let's speak right along those lines. Let's go to the first round of the 93 playoffs. And now you score an overtime goal against the Boston Bruins. And this goal has made day. It's given you, it's taken a life of its own. Uh, it's still talked about today. It's probably looked at today. You, I'm sure a day doesn't go by and today's no exception that somebody doesn't bring this up to you, Brad. Just when did you find out or feel that this thing really took this whole other meaning to it than just you scoring this overtime goal, which was a big thing, by the way? Well, um, the night we won, uh, it's funny. People are saying, hey, what was that? Was that an overtime game seven to win the Stanley Cup? I'm like, no, no, it was in the first <laughs> round. It was, that, it was a fourth game. And but it was the first time the Sabres had gotten out of the first round of the playoffs. Now, back in the old system, right, the Adams division, you had the Boston Bruins, you had the Montreal Canadiens, and then you had three other teams. You had Buffalo. Yeah. And I say that, respect, like yeah. you had Buffalo, Hartford, and the Quebec Nordiques. And um, Quebec was a really good team for, for a period of time there in the 80s as well. So all of a sudden, Buffalo's had, no matter who and how well they played all season, or at times, they knew they were facing one of those teams. And um, it, it, anyway, so in 93, we, we, we sweep the Bruins in overtime. Um, I score this goal. It was awesome. Uh, it was so fun celebrating with your teammates and, and everything. And I came out, well, I never heard the call. So you can have an image and then you can have the, the, the sound bite that goes along with the image describing it or, or illustrating what happened. And you have some sportscasters that do a you know remarkable job with it and some are, are, are just average. Let's call it that. Mm -hmm. Rick Jenneret's one of the best, and he's of one course. of the most people. And when he does this, well, I don't hear it until tomorrow, right? Because it's 1130 at night. Like, we're racing to go out and have some fun after we win. And I didn't even know because the actual TV guys in Buffalo, um, they didn't – Rick Jenneret did radio at the time. So they signed, it wasn't even a simulcast. They took Rick Jenneret's radio call and matched it to the image that you saw on TV. Mm -hmm. Imagine, right? It didn't, it, no, people in Buffalo are like, oh my God, I remember when he called Mayday, Mayday. When I was watching, I'm like, you know what? You're, we, we kind of forget what exactly happened because mm -hmm. there's not a chance in the world anybody watching TV was listening to a radio and heard the two calls simultaneously, right? It's kind of strange. So anyways, that's how good Rick Jenner Ed is because his call was absolutely by the moment, by the frame was just like iconic. And I am so proud and it's great. And we're tied in the hip. I, I will never be in the hall of fame, which is fine. But I, but my name and that call went in when Rick Jenner Ed was inducted in the hockey hall of fame. Now have you and Rick had chats about it over the years? I'm sure. And had a few chuckles. Yeah. Rick says that he made me a lot of money. <laughs> well, and you, and you hit, and you and I, I said, "Hey, Rick, you know what? Um, no, you know what? He's so good. He 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 yeah. his, his two feet. The only thing I said to him is, that, you know what? Like I actually did score the goal, though. You know, like your call was great. But I did score. Um, but he's a fantastic guy, and um, he's still going. Buffalo loves him. I think the NHL and hockey fans love that voice, whether you like the Sabers or not." Um, and, and, and there's no question he's going to go down, go down in, in Buffalo sports lore for sure. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't. You, we've touched on a little bit. Squid's touched on a little bit about guys liking to have fun. I'm speaking to a mutual friend of ours yesterday, actually, and actually today too as well. When you're smiling already, you know it's going to be Russ Minor. And he asked me to remind you about a story. And this is, this is a pretty good one about you. Either your, He thinks it's your second year in the league. In New York, you're a kid from Markham, so you're not, you don't have the savvy of the big city guy. You're in New York. You guys end up after a game in some establishment where there's yep. some rock stars. I think yes. David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth. And, and then the next day, some things unfolded, and a whole story came around that. Maybe you want to pick up and tell us the, what happened? Um, you yes, I will. Been. No, I will, and I'll tell you. It's a great story. Tell you the story. It, it's uh, we were in New York City. We went to a place called the China Club. We lost six five that night. Dave Anderchuk um, was was outstanding. Anyways, after the game, I think we won or lost. Maybe we won. I don't know. But we ended up going out that night. It was a Sunday night, and um, we go to this place. David Lee Ross in there. I'm a Van Halen fan. Um, 
I got to meet him, which was really neat. Um, anyways, the next morning we have a seven o'clock bus or six forty-five bus going to the airport, and we have a nine o'clock flight, and we're flying from from or from New York City. We're flying to San Francisco because that's the first year the San Jose Sharks came to the league. <laughs> at the Cow Palace. My roommate and I didn't wake up for the bus and probably it had consumed a few drinks, but by the way, I'm 19 years old, so you're not supposed to do that. And um, we didn't wake up. Nine o'clock in the morning, 9.15 in the morning, my phone rings, I answer it, and it's Pat LaFontaine, and he's actually on the airplane. Probably the first year they ever had, they had a, they had a phone in the back headrest of the middle seat in the back row of the airplane, if you remember those days. And um, he called and he's like, hey, are you okay? And I, I'm like, oh, my God. And I panic and I hang the phone up. And then and so he calls back anyways. And um, he's like, hey, are you, are you guys okay? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you've missed the plane. There's two tickets waiting, you know, at, at not the gate, but um, get to the airport, pick up your tickets. There's a flight in a few hours or some, something to that effect. So I hang the phone up. Bob Corkum um, and I, we, we go, get down to the lobby. We run out onto the street in New York City. Now think about it. I'm from Markham, Ontario. Just imagine. And I, I grew up in Scoville prior to that. Like I'm not really a big city guy. And um, I, I, I say to the cab driver, he, I said, you know, take me to the or take us to the airport. And um, which one? He just, <laughs> <laughs> he just sat there and he's like, which one? And I'm like, what? So then I look at Bob who's a college graduate from Maine University or whatever, wherever he went, he had no clue. So we were like, okay, what are you talking about? The guy says, LaGuardia. Well, I've never heard of the name LaGuardia in my life, so it can't be LaGuardia, which would be the smartest thing now if you go through New York, LaGuardia. Yep. New work, but that's in New Jersey. Like New York, why in the world? I'm in New York City. Why? I'm not driving to New Jersey to fly out, which is maybe one of the easiest airports to get. And then it was JFK. And I'm like, that guy used to be the president. That's exactly what I thought. That guy used to be the president. So yeah, it's got, take us to JFK. Well, you don't go to JFK to fly to San Fran. Certainly um, it was a dumb decision by us. We ended up having to pay for our flights ourselves. And um, we got out there and John Muckler, who was our coach, because he took over from Rick Dudley. Um, he couldn't have been better the way he treated us, um, made it really hard on us for a while, but um, nobody in the media, nobody knew what happened. Whatever happened behind closed doors, stay behind closed doors. And um, we were taught a valuable lesson that we put our teammates under the gun and, and things happened for the next week or two after that that essentially would come back to Bob and I because we basically put our teammates under the microscope. And um, to be part of a team, you gotta, you got to do everything right. You well, I think, well, I want to interrupt you there because I think the best part of the story, I think you're, you're maybe being modest about it, is that when you went out there, didn't they, didn't they want to have a meeting and say, we're going to do these two bozos, send them down, punish them, and then LaFontaine stuff said, well, wait a minute, let's get the game through the game first and then we'll decide. And you so, went out, you went out so, and had a goal and an assist and a fight, and after think, the game... I think I had two and one or something like that. Did, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. you have a big... And then after the game, Muckler's coming in saying... Never mind that. He's the only guy who showed up. I'm going to pay for the goddamn ticket. Exactly. That's how it all ended, and, and which basically made my teammates. We the next day we were in LA, and there wasn't a puck on the ice for an hour. Guys were you know <laughs> the two guys missed the flight, and then we lost. By the way, San Jose only won eight games that year. We lost like seven <laughs> five. The only good thing was uh, Bobby Corkman and I each like played really well. We played together, got in a few fights, and and. Um, and he, yeah, our teammates, but the older guys, that's the thing, right? When an older guy vouches and stands up for the young guy, and we both were young guys at the time, um, you know, have a responsibility that you, got, you can't make them look bad. And, um, yeah. and we ended up doing that. It was a valuable lesson. And thank goodness I had John Muckler at that time, or Bob and I did, because players, and I'm sure, Vivi, you have stories, players missed airplanes and, and got sent to the minors and maybe ended their careers there. Yeah, there was uh, back in the day that that's pretty much what happened. I mean, uh, but to your story, I was on that trip, and because uh, I had John Muckler as you did, I didn't have the same experience as you did with John, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, he claimed that nobody in the league wanted me. I asked to be traded. I, I very quietly. It was never public, and he said, "Well." 
I said, well, put me on waivers. And uh, he said, well, I already did. And I said, yeah, well, you put me on recallable waivers. Nobody's going to claim me because you're going to recall me and try and trade me. He says it's the same thing. And I said, come on, John, you know it's not the same. And as – I mean, I didn't play in San Jose that game either. I sat in the press box for like three months. And then finally I went to Jerry Me and I said, Jerry, if you – can you talk to John and if the two of you can get together and try and trade me, I, I would appreciate it. But if not, at the deadline, send me to Rochester because I want to play. I, I don't want to eat any more popcorn in the, in the odd because the popcorn there wasn't that good either. <laughs> um, so anyway, I went to Rochester and uh, that was the end of my, my time in Buffalo. And uh, so I didn't have quite the same experience with John Muckler as you did. So. But uh, everybody gets treated differently. Well, speaking of which, in year seven in Buffalo, you get that call that every player dreads coming sometimes, and maybe not in your case, good, but uh, Brad, in your case, you get the call that you're being traded. For Jeff Anderson, you're going to Vancouver. Now, that must have been a pretty hard thing for you to take, especially being entrenched in Buffalo, you're close to home, and all those type of things. But as I understand the story, you, you, were get, you received a phone call in the dressing room from somebody that kind of changed your whole perspective of going out west. I love it. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, yes, I, you know what? And one thing I'd say, being traded the first time is awfully hard. And yeah. you don't understand it. And it's like being dumped at the prom and you, whatever, right? So you, you get, but then the next day you wake up. And, and, and you've got somebody staring at you that wants to fall in love with you. Like, I mean, it's, it's, there's a real like love hate thing about being traded, but it was one of the best experiences for me um, in my career. I moved around a number of teams and met new people and new environments, and new game plans and systems, mm -hmm. and, but got to live in all these different, you know, cities that I loved. So I think being traded is not the be all end all. You know, or there, there's so much more beyond that. But, um, yeah, I got traded. I was in Buffalo. I was in the locker room. And when I got on that phone after being dealt, and by the way, the first thing that I noticed before the phone call with, with Mike Keenan, who was the GM coach of the Canucks at the time, I went into where I actually played that night, because it was after a game, um, to my stall where my equipment would be. I went in around the corner to where my, my street clothes would be. And – there was no mention, like there's no memory that my name may and number 10 is ever, ever resided in that locker room. There was a picture on the wall in, in the TV room, which is you had to walk through our little lounge that I was like prominent. I, it might've been even a mayday mm -hmm. goal. And when I, like I went in an hour after the game and I had traded, that was gone. Like literally when you get traded, you're done. Like it, you're, it's, it's like game over. You know, your, your new life is wherever you're headed. And so I get on the phone. I was pretty upset. And Mike Keenan said to me, he goes, listen, I can't speak to you too, too long. I'm trying to make other deals. But um, think of two names when you go to sleep tonight. And when you get to Vancouver tomorrow at 4 in the afternoon, come to the rink and come see me. Mark Messier and Pavel Bure, because they'll be your line mates for the rest of the year. And then we had Vancouver's case. They had 27 games or thereabouts left. And I hung the phone up from literally like having tears in my eyes thinking, oh my God, I just got dumped to hanging the phone up and looking at my father who was with me saying, oh my God, like, let's go. Like, like the future's ahead of us. Let's go. We can't worry about what's happened in the past. And, and um, it, it was great. It was a great, great phone call. I'll never forget it. Mike Keenan's one of my favorite guys. Um, I know a lot of guys had hard times with Mike. Mike was um, like so good with me and, and gave me an opportunity to continue to play. It's great you didn't have quite the same experience with Mr. Keenan. No, uh, first of all, I want to. First of all, Vancouver is a beautiful city too. Uh, to play in Vancouver, I, I didn't have the chance to play there very long, but I love the the, the city of Vancouver. But yeah, I had Mike. Uh, I got traded to Chicago, which from Toronto, which was very disappointing. And Bob Murdoch was our coach my first year. I played with Savard and Larmer. And all three of us scored over 40 goals. So I had a 43-goal season. The next year, Mike Keenan comes in. And basically, I can't play. So I just play power play. And he never called my name. The only thing he would do is he would give me a little kick in the rear end when it was 
time to go out and stand in front of the net and get knocked around and on the power play. So uh, anyway, he traded me the day after Christmas to Buffalo. And, you know, that I think that was probably the, the, the worst I ever felt and the, the, the most angry I ever was at an individual was when, because he tried to soften the blow by saying that, you know, I, I know you'd like to be near Toronto for the end of your career and this and that. I go, well, Mike, I'm not from Toronto. I'm from Prince Edward Island. And he said, well, I know, but I know you'd like to be. I said, listen, it's not the end of my career, for starters, and you're not doing me any goddamn favors. So the only favor you're, ba- you're doing is you're giving me a chance to play. And uh, so it all worked out pretty good in Buffalo for a few years until injuries started piling up. But so there's two coaches that you had great experiences with that, you know, I had horrible ones with. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's kind of just the way the game is and the way the game evolves. And, you know, you could probably talk to 40 guys, 20, and I, 20 would say they had bad experiences with those two guys. And the other 20 would say they had great experiences. And I always equate it back to the old, in our days, 21 players on on the team. And the coach's job, seven players hated him, seven loved him. And the coach's job was to keep the seven that were in the middle away from the seven that hated him. And uh, and if you could do that, you'd be successful. Well, you know, we had Gabby on a couple of weeks ago uh, talking to us, and he said the same thing, 23-man roster, and you've got 23 different personalities, and you've got to get to understand each guy. It's not the X's and O's. It's getting to understand the guy you're dealing with, and not everybody's going to get along. So it's it's just part of human nature, and it's it's going to happen. It happens in every facet of life. Why should pro sports be any different? But, you know, it, but I will say Mike Keenan, of all the coaches I had in the National Hockey League, was probably the best coach I ever had. When he was on the bench, he was in control. He ran the bench extremely well. We were well prepared. And he had E.J. McGuire with him too, which really helped as his assistant. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he was probably the best coach I ever had. But boy, could he be a dick when he wanted to. Boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's funny. So um, with Mike and just all these experiences, right? It's so true. And that's why a player in one city gets traded and breaks out and has a banner year and continues to play. And other players, you know, they get traded from a, from a poor environment and, or, a, or a good environment. And they go to a new city and they can't play and they, they're not nearly as good. So, you know, whether you're on the ascent in your career or on the descent, um, the relationships that you have make such a difference. Great story. Um, Mike Keenan said, listen, so you sit around on the bus, the airplane, there's so much idle time. You bitch and complain a lot, right? Like as guys, or you certainly, you certainly love to gossip and banter. We all love to air our grievances and can't believe it. I only played eight minutes last night. And all right, I only played 10 minutes last night. I should play more. And then your buddy, cause you're talking to your best friend or friends on the team. They're like, Oh my God. Yeah. You're a good player. You deserve more ice time. And all of a sudden, here's the thing. He, he's half friend. Because he played 13 minutes when you only played eight. If you if you got the if you got eight more minutes, then he will get less. It's it's a balancing act. You're not going to keep everybody happy. So what Mike said is stop bitching and complaining to your teammates because they don't give a shit. Your teammates don't care because at the end of the day, if they're they're not if you're not playing, one of them are. So nobody really gives a shit. So, you know, what? if you want to complain, come talk to the coach or go home and tell your wife. But nobody else cares. And it really is true. It really is true that um, so much time is, is misspent, you know, in the, with these conversations. At the end of the day, you can, you, you can only do as much as you can do. And, and if you have to really, you know, gain favor, gain trust and confidence in the coach, then you know what? you got to do what the coach wants. Exactly. 
And that goes on in every facet of life, as I said. I mean, I worked on Bay Street for 40 years, and it, I don't think a day went by somebody wasn't complaining or bitching about something. And the whole objective of the whole thing is like a hockey player, just do a better job or play better, and you'll get recognized, and you'll get more ice time. The way um, in 2004, you were partially, I'll, I'll use the word partially involved in one of the most ugly incidents in NHL history with Todd Bertuzzi and Steve Moore. And for the listeners who aren't aware of this situation, I'm sure most are, it was a retaliation for a shot against the Canucks captain, Marcus Nazan, who ended up missing three games as a result of the hit. The hit was deemed legal by the NHL. There was no penalty. There was a lot of banter about it. Uh, in, you know, Coach Mark Crawford made a lot of noise after the game about it. Brian Burke, the GM, called it a marginal player attacking a superstar. And Brad, you know, I guess in the heat of the moment, you made a comment, something to the effect that there would definitely be a price on Moore's head, which the media just jumped all over as a bounty. Do you want to pick the story up there and just make a comment about that? Because there is, I do want to make a point when you make your comment about uh, relating it to the game of hockey. Sure. So just going to that, it was that game, that game in itself is maybe one of my best games I ever played in the National Hockey League. I scored two goals. I had 47 or 51 penalty minutes. I had three fights. I think I had maybe a 10, I don't know, game misconduct in there as well. Our team lost 9-2. Steve Moore scored the seventh goal of the game. And that's that night. Okay. And then that was, of course, everything we saw. The images, it's ugly. Nobody likes it. It's bad for hockey. It's a black guy. Yeah. But you can't put all violence and all sorts of and, 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 uh, motivation of violence on one player. And, that, and people tried to do that with Todd Bertuzzi. Um, the game of hockey is, has lived and, 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 and has been um, policed by itself. You know, players and, of course, the ma- management and, and ownership and, and, and the league, they, they levy fines and suspensions and whatever. This went beyond that. It turned into a legal battle, civil lawsuit for 10 years. And I don't want to go there. I don't even want to tell you what I think about it. Um, I'm going to keep that to myself. Two weeks prior to that game, we played um, Colorado twice. So in a matter of two weeks or two and a half weeks, we played Colorado three times. And we're trying to finish first or whatever in our division to get the highest seed. And, of course, in Colorado, they had Sackick and Forsberg and and everyone else, Rob Blake, they're a really good hockey team. Um, and we had to try to match them. Well, they're beating us seven or eight points going into this first of three games. I'm on the ice. Marcus Nazan's leading the NHL in scoring. He gets hit. And by the way, the hit's the hit. It's hockey. Um, it was definitely marginal. I don't know if it was late. It was a headshot. Prior to headshots being really like a, a big deal in the NHL, um, Marcus got hurt. He, he went and he spent the night in the hospital. Um, he was my roommate, one of my best friends in Vancouver. Anyways, so after that game, I went into the locker room and I'm putting my suit on along with my buddies and we're going to go in a cab. We're going to the hospital in Denver. We're spending the night. We're going to go see our buddy. And um, our reporter, print, print guy, Ian McIntyre, he's on TV on Sportsnet now in Vancouver doing Canuck games. Really nice guy. I have no problem with Ian, and I really think he does a great job. Um, he, he, we were talking, and he said, um, what's going to happen the next two games, right? Because we're in this kind of almost call it like a, a two out of three series mm-hmm. against the, the Avalanche. This is prior, prior or before proceeds the playoffs. And um, I said, it looks like we put a bounty on a man's head, Ian. That's exactly what I said. Mm-hmm. And he laughed because that's a line from Slapshot. Mm-hmm. It's and we and, and basically as if I'm Wyatt Earp and I put a bounty like you know what I mean? I put a bounty on his head. Like that's the dumbest thing ever. That's that's old Wild West and I'm from Stovall, Ontario. It doesn't work that way. Um anyways, I make the comment, he writes it in his story the next day, it gets legs, people pick it up. Well now we play the second game, it ends up being one of the best games of the year, five five tie, boom, nothing happens. Well, we get to this that fateful night. So I did say it. I own it. I did, but it was in jest. And, it was, and if you actually had cameras, that's why sometimes when you read something in the paper and you don't have video, like if you're watching me talk, tell the story right now, you know that I'm telling you the truth and you know that I'm not like that, that Brad May puts a bounty on a man's head and print has no emotion to it. Right. And, it, and it, no context to it. So anyways, that's what happened. It goes on. Well, a couple years later, Steve Moore sues Todd Bertuzzi, Brian Burke, Mark Crawford, Vancouver, Orca Bay, 
Brad May. I get sued in it too, civilly, but from Steve Moore, which is an absolute crock of shit. And beyond that, I don't want to tell you how I feel. But um, I get the idea. Best- <laughs> I think I think we know. <laughs> I had one of the best games of my career that night, and you know what? There's not a chance in the world that Brad or me. I'm not going after Steve Moore. I fought Peter Worrell. He's six foot seven twice that night because Steve Moore hit Marcus Naz in the game of hockey. You know what? It pleases itself. I know that night was ugly and it turned, uh, turned wrong, but I did what I was supposed to do. I was a tougher guy in Vancouver. And when you have a battle against the other team, you fight the toughest guy in that team and you move on. And it's a war of attrition and hopefully you score more goals. That, that's the bottom line. Well, let me give you, let me, hang on, Scott. Let me just go here with this. This is why I wanted to t- touch on this because let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum with 20 year old teams, Buffalo. 2011, you're playing Boston in Boston Garden. And Lucy, Mila and Lucic runs over Ryan Miller. I'm sure everybody's seen that film before and just runs it. Not one Buffalo player in the ice did a thing. Right. After the, Rick Jennerette went, lost his mind on the air seeing somebody go after him, beat the crap out of him, get him, get him, get him, all this stuff. Paul Gostad, who was on the ice at the time, was so ashamed, he couldn't face the cameras after getting interviewed in the dressing room. They interviewed Lucic, and Lucic looked at me at the rate of uh, retribution coming back, and he went, from who? Who's going to fight me on this? Like, he challenged them and called them out on national TV, that, and, you know, then the words like soft, weak, gutless, all these words came out about the Buffalo team. They lost 23 of the next 33 games, missed the playoffs, and haven't made the playoffs since. And Paul Gosta, the next game, went out and fought Lucic. And Lucic, to his credit, Nash Hockey League, let him fight him. He could have beat the hell out of him, maybe he didn't. But it settled the score, but it's still that mark had been made on Buffalo. So where is the – and then, by the way, Buffalo next year outside six foot eight, John Scott. So where does the fine line come in hockey? Because – there's got to be some room for that to place itself, as you just pointed out. And here's a perfect example of the end where it did not happen. And look what it's done to a franchise. I 100% agree. I, I think I could even be more animated about it. Um, it's awfully, it's such a, it's a, it's a fine line. Um, listen, at the end of the day, fighting is, it's not outlawed, but it's, it's, it's being legislated out of the game and maybe for all the right reasons. I don't know, but I can tell you one thing. Um, when you do something, every every I'm trying to think. Um, what Darcy Tucker running around as a Toronto Maple Leaf and, yeah. and the scores that had to be settled when when Ottawa is playing Toronto in the playoffs a number of years ago, long time ago, and and Corson has to take care of business, you know, with the Ottawa Senators. And you look at all these things. Don't we love that? One of the best games of this past hockey calendar, which is now a year, you know, it's almost a year ago because of, of, of the absence, was Matthew Kachuk and Zach Cassian, right? Edmonton, Calgary. And that's when Kachuk would take and runs at Cassian. Cassian snaps. He ends up getting suspended. But I'll tell you what, that was the greatest night of hockey. Good for Kachuk to stand up for himself and do what he does. But he deserved a beating. He did. He deserved a punch in the chops. And, and, and that's the game of hockey for me. I liked it. I like that. I don't want to promote violence to you know, kids in certainly amateur level sports. It's not about that. But we get paid millions of dollars, or I say we, the current players get paid millions of dollars a year to perform. And you know what that, perform, that performance is supposed to be? Wins and losses, really, at the end of the day. And if your team wins more, more than they lose, they're going to have a, a better year at the end. And um, all of this, all of this emotion that's attached to these, these events, of course they can go sideways, but we're waiting for it. We want to see this until it happens. And then all of a sudden you throw the book at the person who does it. It's a joke. It's so hypocritical. And any media member that actually would like to challenge me on this and have a, dis- a dispute or a discussion, I absolutely – Win the, I'll win the argument 100%. Because you know what? The threat of the fight is more, inf- more important than the fight itself. Well, uh, yeah, Brad. And I wanted to touch on that because, um, like, do you really think that perhaps back in those days, and, and certainly in my day for sure, the way the game was played and the way that guys took care of business when, it, when they needed to uh, – you know, and now it's completely different. Like it's, it's gone 
180. I mean, it's just turned the opposite way. And now, you know, guys are running guys, uh, you know, headshots and, and what have you. Although, mind you, what a lot of them deem a headshot was just a normal hit back in 1985 or, or 1992. And now it's kind of, it's, it's flip-flopped. And now guys are getting suspended for, for hits like that. Do you think that perhaps if the league allowed the players to police the game like they used to, would it be a little bit better? Do you know what? Uh, so here's the funny thing. I, 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 I loved, first of all, I had a little bit of ownership in the NHL. So as did you for the time that we were there, we're players. So we actually were part of, you know, judge jury as executioner. We were part of it, you know, with your teammates, the way the game was, the way we were, you know, we developed to get to the NHL. The only thing I'd say is Vivi, we're not players in the league anymore. So we don't, and we can weigh in on our, on how our experiences were, but quite honestly, it's up to the 750 members of the NHLPA to determine what, what they want, what they want out of the game. If they want to challenge the NHL, it's up to them, not us. Um, I would say that the guys currently in the NHL started playing minor hockey at all levels, but with a stop sign on their back. Mm -hmm. That was never part of the way we grew up. I, we grew up, they didn't have hitting until like 11, 12, 13 years old in certain states and, and countries, right? Where when we started, when I started in 1973 or four, when I, my first time on the ice, I wore a helmet with a, with a chin guard, no face mask. And there was hitting in toddler hockey. I don't know if that's novice or whatever the, the title was. Yeah. Um, we, we had a completely different experience. So you think of all these international tournaments and stuff, I think the players, they, even if there was a fight, half, first of all, half the league is European today. 5% was European when you, you played and probably 15 to 20 when I finished. Right now it's, it's close to 50, 50 being European players. They, they grow up and they're developed in a different, different system, just different concepts. So I think even when there is a fight, the player on the bench is going, that's, that's a sideshow. Like, I don't really understand. Like, he didn't do anything to him. Well, what, why did that happen? And that's what the pundits and, and some of these media members ask, is what happened. Well, you know what? My answer is, I'm playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. First of all, it doesn't matter. We're, we're trying to win. And, and you know why I fought today? Yeah, he didn't do anything to me. But you know what? Seven years ago, he, he did something to my buddy when I was playing in Vancouver. Or I was, a, I was watching, and he did that. You know what? I don't need a reason. To give the, the kick the shit out of somebody, I don't. I'm an NHL player in our day, right? That's and that's the way it works. And then, I mean, I just we, with this discussion, I would love to continue at some point because I think it's very, very critical to the game of hockey. But um, time is not allowing us that. But we do have uh, some minutes left here to get through a few things with you. One, the lockout year comes after this Moore incident. You become a free, unrestricted free agent and you sign with Colorado, the team where all this went down. Now you go there. I'm sure in your wildest dreams, you didn't think you were going to get the reception from the fans that you did. And, but it turned out to be probably a good thing for you because then you end up back in Anaheim getting the last laugh winning the Stanley Cup. And one of your old mentors, I guess, or one of your old GMs, I guess, I don't want to give him too much credit, Brian Burke, brought you back to Anaheim with him. So just talk about that whole circle of events. So I'm, at, I'm, I'm right where I'm sitting, right mm -hmm. in the, the next room over um, in, in 2004. Um, excuse me, my, it was actually 2005 at this time. Yeah. Um, right? 2004, five, five, yeah. six. Yeah. So, yeah, 2005. It was in August. I signed with the Colorado Avalanche. They were the first ones to call me and say, hey, we'd like to sign you when, when, the, when that window opened up. Rob Blake, Joe Sackick. Oh, my God, this team, right? Colorado, yeah. Rock Mountains right there. And they're a good organization. Pierre Lacroix is a, a fantastic man. He was general manager at the time. And um, Craig Billington called me and he said, listen, would you like to be a member of the um, Colorado Avalanche? I go, absolutely. And now I'm a Vancouver Canuck. I think I'm going to sign with Vancouver. But they already had a week to sign me to be back in Vancouver. Yeah. People in Vancouver hated my guts because they thought I was a traitor, that I'd go to the Colorado side. <laughs> well, no, Vancouver didn't offer me any money to continue to, you know, to, to play and, 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 and work. Um, I, went, I go to Colorado. 
the whole city, they, first time on the ice, 18,000 people booed me and they booed me for about 20, probably two months. Every time I was on the ice, um, I was a hated man. Mark painted with the brush of two years ago, whatever happened, like we were just discussing. And my kids were being, not bullied, but they were at school. Anyways, the first two months were awfully difficult. But you know what? The greatest lesson I learned, and I would love to impart it on you guys, is when you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. Mm -hmm. When you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. I have nothing to be ashamed of. So I just said, you know what? If they don't like me, I'm going to knock them down one at a time. So all of a sudden, you meet the person that doesn't like you, and you 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 eat at their restaurant and all of a sudden they're like hey, that, that guy's got a nice young family they're nice people oh my god he was a nice guy turn a month two months later now you've knocked out and then you know what you know what's you know how fickle and hypocritical people are Absolutely. and i'm one of them I'm sure, is the moment i jumped in for joe sackick when he was getting worked over by matthias nordstrom from the la kings in the corner and then i got i think i, I started a fight whatever it was i jumped in i came to his defense Five, 6,000 people that were booing stopped. They started to cheer. Now I'm in the penalty box the next game, and now they're chanting, we want May. All the, like, those are the same people that hated my guts three days ago or last week. And, um, and it's just it becomes part of the, the, the spectacle of sport, which I love. But um, don't ever be afraid. When you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. And, and, and it was a great lesson for me. So then you end up in Anaheim. Tell yeah. us all about that. And well, I'll make, I'll make it quick. We watched the Stanley Cup being awarded last night, and I don't like talking about it often, certainly with other players. And, and I'm being serious with Rick in, in the conversation with us right now. I know Vibe, he's got a bunch of buddies that have won the Stanley Cup, and he never won the Stanley Cup. And I don't want to be that blowhard and sit there and tell you about these experiences in front of former and, and your peers, former players, your peers. Um, I had an unbelievable time. We won the Stanley Cup three months after being traded at the deadline to Anaheim. Last night when those guys were skating around, all I could think about was I had my family, I had my kids, I had my mom, you know, my mom and dad, my parent, my, my in-laws were all on the ice with me. And I had such a wonderful family that I owe so much to that they could, ex they could experience it and share it with me when we won. And I felt not sad, but I was like, it was nice to see Ryan McDonough in an embrace with his parents. It was really nice see um, these players you know that did have their family members there but they didn't all have representation there um, this year's different it's the greatest experience of all time to be a hockey player certainly in my experience and uh, last night I literally it was it was so fun to watch but that's why I say about Dallas I feel so heartbroken for those guys because they played so hard to get so close but guess what nobody remembers second well let me let me touch on the cup thing for a sec because I remember one of the we weren't allowed to stay up and watch well our games and PEI started at nine o'clock in the evening so we could watch the first period we had to go to bed and the one thing my father did with me was he woke me up every year when the Stanley Cup was being presented so that was one thing I grew up with as, as a young boy and, and that stuck with me for for forever and it's the one, like, I have very few regrets in my life, Brad. I, you know, and, and Mike, I have probably yeah. could count them on one hand, okay? And the biggest one is I didn't get to hold the Stanley Cup and win it. And uh, watching all those teams receive the cup over the years, uh, when I was a kid growing up, it, it still kind of is, is my biggest regret that I never got to win that cup. And, and hold it over my head. And uh, because I, I think it's the hardest trophy in pro sports to win. I, I really do. And it's probably the nicest looking trophy of all of them as well. Best presentation, best yeah. celebration with it, best way they in integrate the players with it to have their day with the cup. There's, there's nothing better. And I'm sure Brad has probably got a dozen stories. So you that. should not be ashamed of no, talking you about how great it was for you. No, no, but I'm not – listen, I'm not ashamed at all. I just, I just know where – like I, I like to be – I like to be aware of where I am. I don't want ever want to be a blowhard. That's all. But when you understand – But I want to hear about it. I want to hear how great it was and everything because uh, – Well, know, let me ask yeah. you, Snow Angels and a fountain in uh, Anaheim after you won, Brad? Like um, you did in Washington? <laughs> oh, that's – you know what? So or I, 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 
I guess truly when you watch this stuff now, the celebrations of partying, the, the, everything that, that, that is accompanied with winning, we didn't have social media. Like 2007, not long ago, there was no Instagram, no, no, no Twitter. Yeah. Actually, Facebook was only, only available for university students. Think about that. The world's changed in 13 years. Yeah. Back, back when I started with, with Vivi, the players weren't – now, here's the thing. 1994, or just prior to that, is the first time that players took it home to their hometowns. If you want a Stanley Cup in, in the 70s and 80s, those players, they didn't get to take it to their hometowns at that time. And, and, and so it's evolved. I'm so lucky to have that experience for sure. And we, we talked about it last night for, for hours. That's awesome. How uh, about last night? You see all the players. They got their phones. They're skating around. They're talking to their families. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable how times have changed. You were lucky to have your family all there when you won. And I, I think that is probably the greatest thing in, in sports is when the Stanley Cup is won and the families are there with the players and get to go on the ice and celebrate that moment because it is probably one of the more special moments in, in, in your life when you win a Stanley Cup. Uh, 100%. Um, two things on that. I think the NHL did like a remarkable job. I didn't, I didn't anticipate the product. And by the way, the yeah. intensity, like I didn't, I was watching last night, there was not a crowd or a fan in the crowd and they were pumping in noise and music and it sounded like that there was fan noise and you actually didn't realize that fans weren't on the glass, right? They were just watching the actual sport and they're, they're so competitive. Um, as for the Stanley cup and the social media and the pictures and videos, I wish I had all those videos of all those, those times that I was able to have winning after when they, when the Stanley cup came up to my cottage up here in Lake, Lake Joseph and, and down to Markham, I wish I had all that, but you know what? I'm so happy that we didn't have cameras and we didn't have all that stuff. <laughs> a lot of that stuff is only shared by us, right? Um, because it's a memory. It's not on, on, on any type of media today. You, you see it all. So Ovi in the, in the, in the pond, I bet you has happened over the years, but there was never video of it. Right. But also Ovechkin celebrated like the world was ending. And I loved it. I loved uh, it. Gila <laughs> first, Gila first stole, stole the trophy. And it, it was in his swimming pool. And then he took it to his dad's house and they were searching all over for him. And he paid the guy off at the hall of fame, not to come after him. And they party with him for another day. And this <laughs> is before they got to take it home. Now, speaking of good memories and that you got a nice smile on your face. Here's one. We were talking about coaches earlier and one of the high octane guys, we'll call him. You played for it. And Rick, you know, of this guy so Ronnie Wilson. You come to Toronto in 2009 and you're traded there. There was a very special moment that people probably aren't aware that he did for you that I think speaks to a little bit, a very good show of class. And you know, yeah. what to with your thousandth game. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, as soon as you, like I, as soon as you start bringing this stuff up, I, for, I, I'm not so sure Ron Wilson was, was, as lovable and, and, and understood and the players didn't enjoy Ron as coach. That's true. That that's a hundred percent true. I don't know if his personality really was reflected on, on, on the way he was. Right. So as a coach and as a, who's making decisions on who's playing and not playing and you know what, we're all emotional and maybe we were, we, we, we over overdo it and we misplace our anger and our frustrations on the wrong people. I'd say that Ron Wilson took uh, here's and, and in saying that because I'll, my teammates might watch this and they'll say, Brad, you're an asshole because you didn't, you know, you didn't say it. Way. Listen, not everybody liked Ron Wilson. That's a, that's a truth. But that night, um, or the game I was skating in Ottawa. It was about three weeks, maybe a month prior to playing my thousandth game in the NHL for the Toronto Maple Leafs in my hometown, call it, um, Ron took me aside and he said, listen, you have 20, I'm making it up because I don't know exact date, the numbers, yeah, but he goes, that's fine. you have, you have 22 games to go in the season. You have to play in 17 of them to, to get to a thousand. If I sit you out today or too early, what would happen if you got injured, then you wouldn't make the 20, you know, the 17 games. So here's, if it's up to, up to you, but if, if, what, do you, what do you think about playing your thousandth game against the Buffalo Sabres the second last game of the year on a Saturday night 
in Toronto where your parents can come to the ACC and want, you know, be there with you um, against the team you started your career with. I'd be like, I said, that, that's unreal. He goes, well, the only way we can do that, I have to sit you up four times or five times to actually make that date happen. But you got to play in the other, other games. So as we get closer to, the, to the, that night, I think it was April 5th or whatever it was, the closer we get to it, you're not going to play. Because so the night before he he told me like I got sat out in New Jersey the night before the, the game in Toronto and anyways Ron Wilson had the foresight and thought of that well you know what you can't be the biggest hole in the world if you if you actually have, are that thoughtful and are thinking that far ahead and um, he gave, he set me up to have one of the greatest experiences of my career selfishly um, to be able to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs thousand games um, red. Red Kelly gave me the thousand game stick. He's the first Toronto Maple Leaf to ever play a thousand games. I was the twenty first. I mean, I, I mean, Toronto Maple Leafs have been around for over hundred years. I was the twenty first guy to play a thousand games with a, with the uniform on, and um, that wouldn't have happened at the ACC on that night for my parents and my family if it wasn't for Ron Wilson. So I so I really appreciate that. Well, here I got two things to say about that. One, number one, again, same as we talked about the fine line between play, the players placing themselves and not placing themselves, it's being left to the league. This same note with a guy like Ron Wilson, and then you have what Jason Spezza had done to him by Mike Babcock in Toronto, his first game back in Toronto, a seasoned veteran, and embarrassing him like that in front of his family, his hometown, and the guy came back with his flash to play, and then you play him on the road the next night. I mean, there is a fine line. And, and I think decisions like this, like we discussed before with the fighting and what's gone on with this, are the difference between teams winning and losing in National Hockey League. I don't care what area you're playing, whether it's the 30s, 60s, or 90s, or 2000, it does have an impact. And the second part of the story I'll say is that a, another friend of mine, I have a lot of friends who know you, but somebody would have been standing with you and they said they were talking about Wilson one day. And this will make you, this will help you out a little bit in case some of your teammates do watch this. You were standing talking about said adjustment after practice one day and Wilson kept, there was nobody around and Wilson walked by you and didn't even acknowledge either of you the slightest. And you're, the guy looked at you and said, would you piss him off in practice this morning? He goes, no, he's always like that. He's a prick. <laughs> or something that out of fact, you know, and you just said, that's just him. He doesn't talk we, 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 but here's the thing. So I come into Toronto and I, um, our team wasn't that good, truly in 2009, um, eight, nine, but I came in in 2009 and, um, you played a long and, time. <laughs> every seventh, I get traded. Um, listen, you're not supposed to be happy every day when you're losing. So, it, but it's all about setting a culture and everything else. Um, Listen, I think there's, I think everybody inherently is good, but depending on the pressures that you you, yes. you have with your job, um, it, not everybody handles those pressures and, and does the right thing. That's all. Um, I, I'm 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 trying to understand that more because at the end of the day, to actually waste energy saying negative shit about people and yeah. about your own experiences, yeah, I think we can all just you know what. Like, Sometimes life isn't fair and it just happens and it's, and it happens to you, but it's, it's about how you react to it. Not necessarily what happens to you. So um, that's, that's my take on it. If I could say. Brad, as far as you're right. I mean, I got the opportunity as soon as I finished playing to get into coaching. And one of the things I did was I remembered all my coaches that I had growing up and in, in professional hockey and they also read some books on sports psychology and so on. But the biggest thing that I found was communication with my players. And the fact that I, I took the time every single day of practice, I picked three guys out that I was going to have a conversation with, not necessarily about hockey, but about, okay, are, are the apartment's okay that we have for you guys? Is your, if the guy had a wife or a girlfriend, is she happy? Is everything okay? If there's anything I can do, don't be afraid to call me. I don't care what time it is. If it's three o'clock in the morning and you need something, call me. And, you know, I, I found that by, you know, treating them like they were your sons is the way I did. I looked at it because I treated my sons that way. And, and, I, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing with these guys because I think at the end of the day, they looked at it as this guy really cares about us. And, uh, and they went through the wall and we won a championship, you know? So I, I think coaches could probably learn a little bit from 
guys that, that communicate a little bit better with the players. And uh, I, I think would have a little bit more success in, instead of being a, a hard ass and, uh, you know, an angry every day and so on. Like even, yeah, there's bad days and it doesn't mean you have to be happy, but kind of try to make it a little bit easier for everybody and yourself. Well, well I, I think, I, that, oh, go I ahead, Brad. Sorry. I, I was just, I was just agreeing with, with Rick there. Um, because being a hard ass, we want to work hard. We respect hard work. We really do. Even the, like, even the guy that doesn't work, you know what I mean? Like we love working hard as players, and, but being disrespected or, or the feeling of it. And by the way, perceptions, reality and all this, because a lot of times that message isn't heard the proper right way. You're dealing with young minds. You're dealing with guys that are insecure as players and um, what a sarcastic comment that's supposed to be funny in front of a group of people, or in this case, just go back to Mike Babcock, Mitch Marner, ask him, hey, yeah. who's not pulling their weight? Not that it's not about being funny, but that's maybe about bringing accountability in the room. Well, you know what? It's, it's how that was perceived, and that was throwing a young kid under the bus. And guess what? It ends up being you know, one of the fatal flaws. And maybe the intention wasn't that, but um, it, it, it landed in this pile of shit for sure. Well, I think the thing is, is if you practice two things, decency and common sense, I think that can carry people a long way. And I think you can exercise that anything you do in this life. Now we are, we've kept you for a long time. We really appreciate your time here, Brad. It's been a fantastic uh, interview with you. Uh, I know you're, uh, two things I'm leaving with here. Number one, you're, you're involved in a lot of charities. And one in particular, Easter Seals, I believe is very close to you. Do you want to say a few words about that? I love talking about Easter Seals. Um, I love talking about it with my friend Rick Vive, who has an event um, just like I do for Easter Seals. Um, these children and these families, they need, they need funds, um, private money. So how do you get that? Either people donate or people participate in certain events. And we run a series of hockey tournaments. And, um, and just imagine, I don't know, I'm an able-bodied person today, and my children are as well that you have to put a, a, a wheelchair ramp in your home. By the way, your kid can't get out of the house if you don't have that. You have to put bars in the bathroom. You have to have a bedroom set up differently. You need crutches, you need apparatuses, you know, uh, prosthetics. There's so many things that are needed for these children and these families that, that, that first of all, they got all the stress in the world and then you throw in a financial strain and, and in access to things. Um, for Rick and I, we're both, and I don't want to speak for Rick, but um, so proud to be involved with Easter Seals. The money that's generated goes to the kids and the families. We have an opportunity to, to react and, and, and be, you know, interact with, with the families and kids, been to their summer camp. Um, it where awesome. they, it's awesome, eh, Vivi? Yeah. And yeah. It's, one of the, it's one of the proudest moments, talking about Easter Seals and, and, and other things. And listen, we're not heroes. Like we're doing the right thing because we have a platform and, and we want to make a difference. But um, there's so many people, volunteers. Um, all I, I'm going to leave you with one thing. We're, I, sorry to cut you off, Rick. Just be, just be a good human being. Be a good neighbor and just ask yourself, if what, what, what would I want or how would I like to be treated if I found my, myself with those struggles and, and, and troubles? And um, I guarantee you, you're a better person because your answer that you're going to give yourself might get you off your ass and you might go volunteer and be part of a great organization. Well, I, I lived with it. Uh, my uncle, uh, my mother's brother, uh, was handicapped and blind uh, from birth. Uh, so I grew up with it. And I saw what my grandmother had to go through with him and I, the wheelchairs that had to be bought and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of... For me, it, it's personal. It, it's, I saw it. I lived it. And when I see these kids, when we went to that camp, Brad, I mean, like, I almost had tears in my eyes. It was like to see them so happy to be able to go and do those things because of the money that's raised, well, par partially by our hockey tournaments, to get them the equipment to be able to do that. I, I, I just think it was, it, for me, it was a, a day that I'll never forget because I got to see these kids doing what they love to do. And uh, that those things that they use for those sports they play and everything are not cheap. So 
Um, I know we raise a couple of hundred thousand a year in Kitchener and uh, or more, almost 300 one year. So uh, hopefully we can keep doing it. This year, unfortunately, we won't have the hockey tournaments, but there will be some virtual stuff and people can still raise money and, and uh, they can draft us first overall in 2021. And uh, well, I, I don't think I've ever been drafted first in one of those, <laughs> but um, but yeah, they, you can still raise money and, and, and help the Easter Seals kids. Hey, you know, just, just to finish that is yep. for us and is we don't, we, we, we're not going to be able to have our tournaments this, this fall because of the COVID restrictions. And that's okay. Cause I get a day back or two days back. Uh, um, Rick gets a couple days back that you're, you don't, you're not out there doing something. So you're at home. Um, as do all our participants that play, um, even the volunteers, but the scariest part about it, there's seven or eight different events, Paul Coffey, Eric Lindros, Rick Vive, Brad May, and others. And I, and I, um, in other locations, there's a million plus dollars that aren't raised for families that absolutely need it. So forget that I, I was being a smart ass talking about the days I get back. They're not going to get the money unless people understand that, you know what, your donation or, or your whatever you could give to Easter Seals, it, it can make a difference. So if you're listening to this, maybe look it up, read a little bit about it, take our word for it, but um, do some investigation and, and research. Um, our kids need more money and they need not only that, they need the, 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 the awareness to, um, for people to help them. That's well put, Brad. And, uh, you know, we would certainly do our part. I mean, my wife and I, Deb, we get involved in a lot of uh, charities over the last number of years. So we know the strain that it puts on families and the strain that it puts on the actual person that's being affected by the disease and the organizations itself, because the chase for money is very intense. So it is a very difficult thing. So please, people listening, uh, reach out to us, send us a note. We can send you some information. We can put you in contact with the people that, We'll be, we'll be able to help you if you want to make a donation. Uh, any amount is always good. There's never any amount that's not, not enough for anybody. Well, Squid, he's one of those guys we could talk to for hours, couldn't we? Well, yes, we could. And uh, very intelligent, uh, very well-spoken. Uh, I guess that's why he was doing the color for uh, Vegas. But fantastic kid. Uh, well, I call him a kid, but... Uh, he's, near, he's, he's nearing 50 now, I think, and uh, uh, but wonderful guy and uh, very, very well spoken. Well, what comes through loud and clear to, to, to me is just the passion he had, not only for playing the game, but his role as a player and as a teammate. It's just, it was just oozing out of him and the pride he speaks about it. And it's just, and he's a very humble guy to begin with, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of the above. And I can, I can uh, vouch for it that he was a great teammate. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we want to thank Brad for joining us today. Uh, a terrific job on his part. Uh, looking forward to getting together when we can, when this COVID stuff is all out of the way. Uh, we also want to thank the Hockey News for you know the usual support. And actually, they're all things for your source in hockey since 1947. So again, you can follow us. We'll be, this drops on, this should be Saturday. I mean, we're uh, listening to all of this. Follow us on Twitter at Squid and Ultimate Leafs Fan. Rick is on Instagram and Twitter, also under Rick Five, the Ultimate Leafs fan. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Send us your comments, concerns, and anything you might think that might get our attention. And leaving all of that, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.